So let me start again with uh, exp expressing my pleasure in welcoming you all to this uh, Per Jacobson lecture, uh, which is sponsored by the foundation of the same name. As you may know, Per Jacobson was the BIS economic advisor from September 1931 until October 1956 and then became the managing director of the IMF until he passed away way while in office in 1963. The foundation was established that year and has been closely associated both with the BIS and the IMF. The foundation's goal are to improve international cooperation in the monetary and economic fields, goals that are very closely aligned uh, with the BIS own goals and mission. This year's speaker is our very good uh, and dear friend Jens Weidman, who as you all know was the longtime chair of the BIS Board of Directors and is the former president of the Deutsche Bundesbank. In May, we held a colloquium here in his honor as BIS chair. He spoke then on central bank issues, reflecting on questions such as the future of central banking. From his speech, we caught a glimpse of what he will speak on today in this lecture with a very timely topic, a new age of uncertainty, implications for monetary policy. Certainly, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to hear how we might navigate the evolving challenges the central banking community is facing in implementing a stability-oriented monetary policy. Jens' analytical rigor coupled with his diplomatic touch, which have served our community so well over the years, are especially valuable at this juncture. He has often warned us of the risks of overreaching in central bank mandates. Today, Jens will draw on his rich experience, not just in central banking, but also at the highest levels of policy making in Germany. He will provide us with his reflections on how we might deal with the uncertainty inherent in all policy making, but which seems to be especially acute these days. By reviewing a longer spell of history and taking a more systematic view of the sources of uncertainty, Jens will help address pressing challenges that we are confronting. Jens, we are very, very much looking forward to your thoughts. Immediately after Jens' lecture, we will hear from our high-level lineup of governor panelists, uh, Haruhiko Kuroda, Pablo Hernandez de Cos, Lesetia Caniago, and Thomas Jordan, who will share with us their thoughts, taking cue from the lecture. Afterwards, we will have an open QA question where you are invited to put your questions or comments to Jens and the panel. So please note that we are recording the whole event, including the QA. Uh, to put it on the BIS public website for view viewing later. Let me now give the, the floor to Guillermo Ortiz, also former uh, BIS uh, board chairman and governor, ex-governor of Banco de Mexico, uh, who is here in his capacity of as chairman of the Per Jacobson Foundation. So Guillermo, the floor is yours now. <clears throat> Thank you, Agustin. Well, <clears throat> I will um, welcome you again <laughs> to, uh, to this Per Jacobson Foundation lecture <clears throat> on the occasion of the BIS uh, general meeting. Uh, the last time we met in person was four years ago. You know, time, time goes fast, so uh, we're all very happy to be here in person. No? Almost 50 years, 58 years have passed since the first lectures were delivered by uh, Maurice Freire and Rodrigo Gomez in 1964 here in Basel. 
These lectures were the beginning of a continued effort to carry forward the legacy uh, <coughs> and work of Per Jacobson. As Augustine mentioned, uh, Mr. Jacobson dedicated most of his career to the international public service and international cooperation. He held prominent positions, such as member of the economic and financial section of the League of Nations, secretary head of uh, monetary and economic department of the BIS, as it was mentioned, and uh, managing director of the IMF. <clears throat> With this in mind, the foundation's main objective is to foster and stimulate discussions on global economic and financial issues. Since these first lectures that I mentioned, uh, renowned policymakers and academics from around the globe continue contributing um, to his legacy. Last October, we had the pleasure of hosting Christine Lagarde in Washington, um, who gave a lecture on the future of globalization. Today, we're honored to um, welcome uh, Jens uh, Weidman. He will deliver a lecture titled A New Age of Uncertainty, Implications for Monetary Policy. As Agustin mentioned, Jens has an outstanding career as a policy maker. Prior to that, he was head of uh, monetary policy and analysis division and deputy head of the economics department. He was also a member of the governing council of the European Central Bank. And I could go on and on talking about Jens, but uh, Agustin has facilitated this job. So without further ado, Jens, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Augustine, for your kind uh, words. It's so good to see you all here today and live. And I thank you very much for being here with me. I feel truly honored to speak to you and to speak to such a distinguished audience today. And I must confess, I do miss you. And Augustine, I still have to figure out how to be here in July after having been here in May, June. I think July is still an empty month for me. <laughs> I have been, as you might know, attending the annual meetings of the BAS for the last uh, 11 years. And I've always thought that the Per Jacobsen lecture marked the highlight of these gatherings. Thus, I felt flattered, but also, I must confess, a bit intimidated when Augustine called to ask whether I would be willing to step into the big shoes of all those impressive previous speakers. I accepted with a view to honoring our distinguished predecessor, Per Jacobsen, who shaped two important institutions at the heart of the central banking community, the IMF and the BAS, to which I personally feel very attached. And it is, by the way, in exactly this pioneering spirit of Per Jacobsen that the BIS, under the leadership of Augustine, has adapted over the past couple of years to better serve its constituency, for instance, through the establishment of the BIS Innovation Hub. Dear colleagues, we are gathering in difficult times. Uncertainty seems to be pervasive and on everyone's lips especially, by the way, on those of central bankers. John Williams, earlier this year, delivered a speech entitled A Time of Uncertainty. Christine, a bit later, discussed monetary policy in an uncertain world, and the chairman of the BIS, Francois, talked about monetary policy in uncertain times. So it was difficult to find another title with uncertainty that didn't repeat all those. But these are just some of the many speeches stressing the uncertainty that currently besets monetary policy. Some may look back a bit wistfully to the supposedly less uncertain times of the past, but the question is, are they right in doing so? In any case, the widespread perception that uncertainty is particularly high right now is not a new phenomenon. Some 45 years ago, John Kenneth Galbraith published The Age of Uncertainty. He painted the picture of a world in which the golden age of stability and predictability 
was coming to an end to be succeeded by a period of significantly heightened uncertainty. And four decades later, Barry Eichengreen looked back at this book and came to the following conclusion, I quote, viewed from the perspective of 2017, however, the uncertainty of 1977 seems almost unveilable. If Galbraith were writing the same book in 2017, he probably would call the 1970s the age of assurance. <laughs> the irony is that from today's perspective, the years before the coronavirus pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine look comparatively safe and stable. So, is uncertainty always on the rise? In some I'd say yes. In an increasingly complex world, making predictions and forecasts is becoming more and more difficult. Bob Rubin, in his book, In an Uncertain World, makes the important point that uncertainty forces policymakers to delve into exactly those complexities to identify the relevant considerations and inevitable trade-offs. And indeed, many papers have been written over the past years about the specificities of the environment monetary policy has operated in for so long and the necessary changes to its toolkit to deal with them. Others might say no. Another explanation of the perceived increase in uncertainty could be that the certainty about the outcome of past events and developments takes away their power to frighten. In retrospect, the solutions to conflicts and problems then appear to have been predetermined. But those involved may have felt differently at the time. And as we will hear later, some of the trends that have contributed to an increase in complexity, like globalization, are also faltering. Personally, I felt that the past 15 years have been particularly turbulent, with one crisis after another, and monetary policy has been pushed into uncharted territory. Either way, the words of Charles Bean hold true, wisdom with hindsight is a wonderful thing. But unfortunately, this is a luxury that policymakers don't have. I have dealt with uncertainty for a large part of my professional life, particularly in my role as a monetary policy decision maker. And there were many moments, believe me, when I longed for the wisdom of hindsight. And perhaps I also speak for some of you here in the audience. Dear colleagues, today I would like to take a brief look back at some of these moments. But above all, I want to look ahead and ask the following question. Is monetary policy facing a new era of uncertainty? A number of structural factors suggest that the future of inflation, the future inflation environment, will be different from the one we know. And if this turns out to be true, what then would this mean for monetary policy. And since we are in Switzerland, Thomas, I will take you on a hiking tour. So please get ready, lace up your boots, and join me for the tour. Dear friends, 15 years ago, many thought we were in a permanent Goldilocks economy. With inflation seemingly conquered, large fluctuations in economic output appear to be a thing of the past too. By keeping prices stable, central banks looked as if they were able to moderate the business cycle, thereby providing for overall macroeconomic stability. Much like Francis Fukuyama, who hoped that the end of the Cold War meant that the major ideological conflicts seemed to be settled once and for all. Many economists seem to think that the end of major economic crisis was within reach. For example, Nobel laureate Robert Lucas declared that the central problem of preventing economic depression seemed to have been solved. But on both dimensions, there was too good to be true. And once again, the this time is different trap had snapped shut. The outbreak of the global financial crisis brought the great moderation to an abrupt end. The Lehman Brothers collapse shocked the world economy and marked the beginning of what we would come to know is the Great Recession. During this period, both macroeconomic and financial uncertainty measures rose to their highest level 
since 1960. While we were still dealing with the aftermath of the global financial crisis, the sovereign debt crisis shook the euro area. Measures of uncertainty climbed again, this time notably in the form of economic policy uncertainty. In 2020, then, the world was hit by another shock, the COVID-19 pandemic, and that triggered an unprecedented economic slump, shrinking the global economy on a historical scale. Entire economic sectors came to a standstill. Global trade fell suddenly and sharply, and international supply chains came under stress. Against this background, backdrop, it is not surprising that uncertainty indicators shot up to new record highs across the board. The VIX, for example, a popular measure of the risk-neutral stock market's expectation of volatility based on the S&P 500 index options, rose to 80 in mid-March, up from under 15 a month earlier. And the Global Economic Policy Uncertainty Index jumped from 235 to 437 between December 2019 and March 2020. Thanks to large-scale fiscal and monetary policy support, it was possible to avert, avert a downward spiral. And this exceptional policy response paved the way for rapid recovery. When the restrictions were all lifted, output bounced back. Over the course of the recovery, production in certain sectors was at times unable to keep up with the surging demand for goods. Companies struggled with shortages rising shipping costs and delivery delays. Augustine recently found that, and I quote, the initial policy response to the pandemic was meant to provide a bridge to the recovery. With the benefit of hindsight, policy settings, at least over the past year, may have served as a springboard for the rapid expansion. As a result, in combination with the surge in energy prices, inflation has risen sharply to rates that we have not seen for decades. As this came as a surprise to markets, analysts and also academics, forecast errors and other measure of uncertainty were unusually large. Originally, most observers were expecting the high rates to gradually subside over the course of this year, but Russia's invasion of Ukraine has fueled another sharp rise in commodity prices, especially for energy, and has further disrupted global supply chains. Moreover, the war has darkened the economic outlook and triggered a massive new wave of uncertainty. And as I see it, there's little to suggest that inflationary pressures will ease anytime soon. I agree with Isabel Schnabel in her recent speech on the globalization of inflation, that it is unlikely that global excess demand will dissipate quickly the lingering pandemic combined with strict containment measures in China, for instance, as well as the war in Ukraine, which will probably not end anytime soon, mean that supply bottlenecks will persist for some time to come. Fiscal support packages for the most vulnerable, tight labor markets, and some remaining pent-up demand support the demand side. And this environment, of course, bolsters the pricing power of firms and also the bargaining power of labor. But again, the outlook is exceptionally uncertain. Thus, to sum up the main message of this retrospective discussion, it is safe to say that, at least on average, uncertainty has been markedly higher after the great financial crisis than before. And that broadly holds regardless of the fact that there are many different kinds of uncertainty captured by different indicators. Looking beyond uh, the immediate concerns, the inflation environment could remain clouded in uncertainty and it could shift in an also more persistent way. The economy is facing profound structural change that will also have an impact on inflation as these changes do matter for wage and price setting dynamics. But how these important transformations play out with respect to inflation is very difficult to predict. I would now like to outline some of these structural forces that are contributing to uncertainty over the years to come, and I will lay out how they could affect the future path of inflation. Dear friends, let me begin with the Herculean task of climate action to limit global warming to the targets set out in the Paris Agreement. To be able to achieve these targets, 
the world economy will have to undergo a far-reaching transformation in order to give consumers, producers and investors the right incentives, carbon pricing is required swiftly, markedly and globally. Higher carbon prices may influence consumer prices in multiple ways, of course, directly through higher energy prices and indirectly through increased production costs for businesses. However, the transition to a greener economy might also have dampening effects on inflationary pressures as with a low run, short run, low short run substitution elasticity between fossil and renewable energy sources, real household income and demand could shrink. Furthermore, the transition could also lead to additional political uncertainty, this is what all this is about, that would then weigh on investment. All this notwithstanding overall and with respect to headline inflation, decarbonizing our economy is very likely to fuel consumer price inflation during the transition, and that is over many years. Given the length of this transition period and the persistence of potential price effects, it will be very difficult for central banks to look through them if they want to keep expectations anchored around their targets. While the direction of this induced trend is quite clear, the wide range of different estimates illustrates the high uncertainty surrounding its magnitude. This depends primarily on the timing of the climate policy measures taken, the use of the revenues generated by carbon taxes, and so on. Simulations by the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system indicate that even in the event of an orderly transition, the euro area, for instance, could temporarily experience significantly higher inflation rates. Due to climate policy measures, annual inflation rates up to 2030 could on average be between 0.3 and 1.1 percentage point higher than in a scenario without the influence of climate change and climate policy. <coughs> Pivoting away from fossil energy sources also satisfies the desire to achieve greater strategic autonomy and energy independence. And under the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the decarbonization of our economies could therefore be accelerated further and this would, of course, reinforce climate-related price pressures. A second structural force driving change is digitalization. The digital transformation affects the economy through a number of channels, including productivity, employment, competition and prices. In the wake of the pandemic, many of us have come to acknowledge, and I might say also appreciate, the benefits of digital technologies and we are not alone. A wave of digitalization has swept through our societies and may have reinforced some of the longer term trends. The impact of this digital transformation on inflation is however not clear cut and may also vary over time. On the one hand, the expansion of e-commerce may deliver cost saving and boost price transparency and competition. A study by the ECB, for instance, concluded that the e-commerce effect in the EU has reduced non-energy industrial goods inflation by 0.1 percentage point on average per year since 2003. And these inflation dampening effects are only likely to wane when the diffusion of digitalization and e-commerce technology reaches a saturation point. But when the saturation point will be reached is very difficult to predict. On the other hand, the rise of superstar firms may reduce competition and lead to higher markups in the longer term, although also there, there's a caveat. In a more dynamic setup, superstar firms too might be forced to defend themselves against competition. But looking at markups in the United States since 1982, Otter and his colleagues find that larger companies have higher markups and that the size weighted aggregate markup has increased by more than the unweighted average markup and they conclude that this pattern underscores the centrality of superstar firms for the evolution of the markup. The bottom line impact that the countervailing effects of digitalization will have on inflation cannot yet be quantified. In any case, my personal take would be that the total effect is likely to be limited, but again, uncertainty remains. The third factor I would like to address is demographic change. 
Charles Goodhart's work on this issue has shed new light on the developments on inflation in recent decades. When China, former Soviet states, and other emerging economies entered world markets in the 1990s, they dealt a massive supply shock to the global economy. Augustine said in a recent speech that about 1.6 billion workers from these regions have joined the effective global labor force and that such a boost to global aggregate supply may not be repeated on such a significant scale for a long time to come. Faced with the risk of offshoring and job losses, unions had become more restrained with their wage demands and put job security first. Thus, I do agree with you, Augustine, that the supply shock had marked disinflationary effects, but at the same time, one has to acknowledge, of course, that it is difficult to disentangle these effects from other changes that took place at the same time, such, for instance, as the transition of central banks to inflation targeting and advanced economies. Dear colleagues, practically all countries are experiencing population aging. The imminent retirement of the baby boomers, many of them sitting in this room here, uh, and could reduce the global labor supply over the coming decade, and demographic headwinds holding back wages and inflation would then turn into tailwinds. In addition, population aging will increase expenditures on health as well as elderly care and non-tradable services more generally. And depending on the price elasticity of supply, relative prices, but also the inflation rate will be affected. Indeed, a recent study suggests a stable relationship between demography and inflation in data from 1870 to 2016. But you all know that Charles Goodhart's hypothesis is also not uncontroversial. Countries with more retirees and fewer workers, such as Japan, have experienced particularly low inflation. And one could also argue that population aging leads to less consumption, innovation and investment, and thus also to low inflationary pressures. And this once more underlines the high level of uncertainty. In addition to these three forces, the globalization tailwinds discussed before could also turn into headwinds. Even before the pandemic, protectionism was on the rise. Take Brexit or your straight policy under Trump, for example. Considering the experience after the outbreak of the pandemic, many countries have sought to limit their dependence on global value chains in certain areas, such as the semiconductor or pharmaceutical sectors, and also the war against Ukraine may reinforce this trend, especially with regard to the supply of energy, but also more broadly, as demands for French shoring are rising in the political arena. In pursuit of greater strategic autonomy, there could be a deliberate shift in, in critical supply chains to domestic markets, or at least to regions that share the same values, and this could potentially lead to a world economy that again is divided into two political blocks. All this makes a decrease in competition in labor and product markets more likely, which then will have implications for wage and price setting behavior. And should the retreat from globalization guard the pace, workers will regain bargaining in power, and this would ease the break that globalization has put on wages and prices. The list of structural factors that could have a marked impact on inflation processes is, of course, not exhaustive. And evidently, there are other developments that increase the uncertainty of the environment central banks are operating in, with geopolitical uncertainty being an obvious example. Dear colleagues, have you noticed we have been walking on the path of inflation for quite a while now with our hiking boots. On balance, globalization, digitalization and demographic change may have had a dampening effect on inflation over the past decade. And this goes some way towards explaining why inflation remained stubbornly in the lowlands during that time. But the future path of inflation could differ from its past trajectory as the economy enters a new landscape. The dampening effect that these megatrends have had on inflation so far could fade away or even reverse. In combination with the impact of the green transition, a new inflation environment could emerge. Putting it more succinctly, Charles Goodhart doubts that the economic system we've known over the last 30 years will continue and that further inflation and nominal interest rates will remain at rock bottom levels. His message is that, and I quote, the future 
will be nothing like the recent past. Political reactions to the war in Ukraine are reinforcing or even accelerating some of these existing trends. But a series of price increasing shocks would make a shift toward a new regime with higher inflation rates more likely, as inflation dynamics are, at least in my view, non-linear. With low inflation rates not too distant from the central bank's targets, it is quite likely that economic agents are rationally inattentive vis-a-vis -vis inflation dynamics and don't spend much time or resources in fine-tuning their expectations. These expectations are then basically backward-looking and the central bank's inflation target provides a solid nominal anchor. But once inflation crosses a certain threshold and becomes a matter of concern and also public debate, expectations may react much more strongly to shocks and also de-anchor quickly. Carvalho and his co-authors, for instance, formalized this idea in a new Keynesian model in which the degree to which inflation expectations are anchored depends on an endogenous link between long-term expectations and short-term forecast errors. Forecast errors lead agents to attach a higher weight to more recent observations, which is quite trivial, but subsequent underestimations of inflation would then prompt agents to assume non-stationarity, which then increases inflation expectations, further fueling inflation. The authors can show that their model captures quite well the pronounced rise in inflation expectations in the late 1970s, as well as the remarkably stable inflation expectations since the end of the 1990s. Your colleagues, I'm sure we're all quite curious to see where the inflation path will take us on our hike. But unfortunately, we can't see all that far into the distance because of that fog of uncertainty. Even binoculars don't help us much for two reasons. First, the emerging megatrends that I enumerated will play out in combination. And this further complicates model-based analysis and macroeconomic forecasts, or to put it more technically, model uncertainty will rise. Second, while some uncertainties can be quantified and thus captured by probability theory, this is not possible for several of the developments I've outlined. These are cases of Nietzschean uncertainty where forecasting models reach their limits. Otmar Ising, among others, warned that in a time of structural changes, forecasting models cannot give the right signals if they are based on the past and cyclical experience. I quote, you need a much broader approach to explaining inflation, he said in his uh, paper. In short, looking forward, the fog shrouding the path of inflation may become thicker still and possibly obscure the hillier landscape that lies beyond the lowlands, perhaps also obscuring the fact that a demanding mountain tour lies in wait rather than a pleasant stroll. I mean, this is your hiking group, by the way. <laughs> I'm no longer part of that. So let me focus again on the policy-relevant horizon and also the more immediate outlook and hence on the risks surrounding the economic environment and the inflation forecast. So how should central banks deal with them? The short answer is, it depends. In this setup, monetary policy has to consider a range of possible scenarios about the state of the economy in present and in the future. And the resulting policy decisions may be different from those that would be optimal under certainty or what a prototypical monetary policy rule would suggest. And ideally, they would also be robust to model misspecifications. And depending on how one judges the possible outcomes and associated costs, policy measures can then be more gradual or more aggressive compared with the no uncertainty benchmark. This is all part of a broader risk management approach. It seeks to weigh up the suitability of different policy routes to achieve the inflation target, assuming a certain working of the economy while taking into account the risks and side effects to the real economy and financial stability. Of course, the risk and side effects also differ across policy instruments with unconventional instruments usually associated with higher costs due to their more direct market interference. Cost-benefit considerations may also differ depending on the respective currency area and its specific institutional setup. 
government bond purchases, and you might by now be tired of hearing that. Uh, one example, in my view, these entail risks and side effects that are particularly pronounced in a monetary union of fiscally sovereign member states. Here, these purchases may involve a redistribution of liability risks from the national to the supranational level through the central bank's balance sheet and introduce a fiscal union through the back door without appropriate institutional safeguards. I, I don't continue on that point. The point I wanted to make is with the, this risk management approach, it is important not to discount too heavily the more complex or more longer term side effects and risks. Dear colleagues, in general, heightened uncertainty about the outlook can suggest that monetary policy should adopt a gradualist approach. This is in line with general life experience. When you enter a dark room, you don't run into it, but you move forward one small step at a time. And it also corresponds to Brainard's gradualism principle. When there is uncertainty, in his case, specifically about the transmission or effectiveness of policy actions, then policymakers should react less forcefully than they would under the condition of certainty. One additional rationale for policy gradualism is that sharp changes in policy could cause higher market volatility and pose risks to financial stability, which would then feed back into price instability. However, a wait-and-see approach can also go too far. Let's consider a supply shock as an example. To mitigate its adverse consequences, it may be useful to initially look through the shock and tolerate some deviation from the inflation target at least for a time. But the more persistent the shock proves to be, the more the delay in monetary tightening increases the risk that companies, households and workers will start to expect that high inflation is here to stay. And this risk is greater if inflation was already high for some time before the supply shock occurred. Along these lines, Dupras and his co-authors from the Banque de France um, uh, point out that Brainerd's original contribution neglects, and I think this is a very important point, the influence of a central bank's actions on private sector expectations. And if the central bank fails to internalize the adverse effect of its policy on inflation expectations and reacts with gradualism to uncertainty, its policy instrument will ultimately move by the same amount, by the same increment, but in doing so it will create greater volatility in inflation. Thus, their model serves to qualify Brainerd's gradualist approach. I think it has been written in another situation, but it also applies, in my view, to this one. There are other reasons not to apply the Brainerd principle too, I would say, uncritically. Wieland, for instance, argues in a model with parameter uncertainty and dynamic learning effects by the central bank and as well as market participants that uncertainty might prompt an element of experimentation in policy, thus also weakening the case for gradualism. Thus, the key policy challenge is to find the right balance between waiting for additional information and not falling behind the curve. Another point that I think was worth discussing is that a risk management approach in the context of bouts of uncertainty might lead to asymmetries in monetary policy that come with their own challenges down the road. Studies suggest that greater uncertainty has generally led to a looser monetary policy stance. For the United States, Caggiano and his co-authors, as well as Evans and his colleagues, provide evidence for risk management approach by the Fed. And the latter also uh, argue that if monetary policy is constrained by the zero low bound under uncertainty, the optimal policy would then be to delay interest rate liftoff. And this is what we all observe, and Otmar Issing, uh, I think, described this asymmetry of monetary policy as follows. Most central banks seem to follow a strategy of reacting quickly and decisively in the case of an economic downturn, but only reluctantly and very moderately when the recovery is gaining steam. It's a bit of a different sort of uh, asymmetry. But there are plenty of ways to rationalize asymmetry in monetary policy and to explain it, the different rationalization of an asymmetric monetary policy response with respect to uncertainty this time is given by Angeloni and Al in the context of the past decades stubbornly low inflation. Within an estimated DSGE model of the euro area, the authors argue that monetary policy should overstate rather than understate the persistence of inflation and that an aggressive 
response to inflation shocks is advisable when there's uncertainty about the degree of inflation persistence. And the reason is that the cost of underestimating inflation persistence is higher than making the opposite mistake. I mean, the intuitive reason for that is that in a sense, with low persistence, policy mistakes are corrected almost automatically. Also, a monetary policy relying on R star as a guidepost may have introduced an asymmetry in the policy erection function during the recent uh, decade, as pointed out by Claudio. Temporary breaks on inflation that would imply surprisingly stable inflation rates could have led the central banks to revise R star downwards, encouraging it to, or them to loosen policy stance further. In any case, central banks all over the world have employed measures hitherto considered unconceivable, pushing interest rates to zero or below, providing massive amounts of liquidity and purchasing assets on a prodigious scale. In doing so, central banks have resorted to unconventional measures and on an unconventional scale. Some have suggested that central banks have become inured to reacting to any kind of economic shock with additional monetary stimulus, if only to avoid being accused of inaction. Focusing on QE, Mervyn King notes that, uh, quote, QE tends to be deployed in response to bad news, but isn't reversed when the bad news ends. As a result, the stock of bonds held by central banks ratcheted up, expanding their balance sheets into the longer term. And I guess we might debate this, uh, but there's one thing that is clear, the central bank balance sheet, they have ballooned. In the past, in 2007, the central banks in the euro area, Japan, the United Kingdom and the United States, had total assets ranging from 6 to 20% of nominal GDP. By the end of 2020, the Fed's balance sheet was 34% 34, 34 of GDP, the euro system's 59, the Bank of England's 40, and the Bank of Japan's 127%. And this continued uh, loose monetary policy was accompanied by risk and side effects, first of all, Large-scale government bond purchases made the central banks the largest creditors of government. And this made monetary policy more and more closely intertwined with fiscal policy. And secondly, there are also habituation effects. As cheap money and central banks were always on standby to respond to crisis, this was increasingly seen as the norm and the burden of action was shifted from governments to central banks. And such tendencies may endanger the independence of central banks in the long run. Ricardo Rice puts it this way, with its mystical ability to print money and its frequent purchases of government bonds, it is tempting to look at central banks as a source of solace and respite. Furthermore, if central bank reacts, uh, react asymmetrically and systematically so, the headroom for action will diminish over time. And Claudio again underlines another risk of this asymmetry in monetary policy, namely that it could fuel financial imbalances down the road and confront the central bank with an unpleasant trade-off. Boosting output in the near term may run the risk of a possibly larger downturn in the longer term. This asymmetric policy response can contribute to a downward trend in nominal rates and given broadly stable inflation also real rates over time. So as you can see our hike has now taken us into altogether into an altogether different landscape. We have reached the Himalayan terrain of the central bank balance sheet, where with each new shock, a new and also loftier plateau is reached. But the higher one climbs, as every hiker knows, the thinner becomes also the air. And indeed, central banks seem to have fallen victim to a kind of altitude sickness. And in this state, finding the way back down becomes increasingly difficult. Among these balance sheet peaks, central banks are currently following a variety of different routes. Some have already started their descent from the summit, some have reached a high plateau, and others are still on their way up. But for all of them, the normalization of monetary policy will be a tremendous challenge. The highest rate of inflation in decades, structural changes in the inflation processes, and the high level of uncertainty make this task even more delicate. The one bright spot is that longer-term inflation expectations for the United States, but also for the euro area, seem to be staying anchored around the central bank's target. These are the fruits of the credibility that central banks have earned 
through their commitment to price stability. And this provides monetary policymakers with headroom, obviating the need for, uh, for them to react to each and every deviation from the target, hence more technically reducing the costs of policy gradualism. Although, again, Ottmar pours some water in our wine, and rightly so in my view, when he finds that with inflation having been off the radar for so many years, it is no surprise that expectations are oriented to the past when the dominant expectation was that price stability would continue. Central banks' credibility played a decisive role in backstopping that view, but credibility can always be called into question. Thus, the bottom line from this is that central banks should not overstretch their hard-earned credibility. Anchored inflation expectations cannot be taken for granted. They have to be offended time and time again. Inflation rates have been above target for quite a while now. The longer actual inflation rates exceed the target, the more likely it is that doubts will arise about the central bank's ability and perhaps also commitment to stabilize inflation at target. Regarding the rise in inflation in the last two years, it is also noteworthy that inflation rates were not correctly anticipated by surveys or market data immediately before the publication. The poor ability of markets and analysts to forecast current inflation may also create uncertainty about the quality of these indicators. And given this additional uncertainty, the ongoing overshooting of inflation and the repeated inflation surprises a wait-and-see approach becomes more and more risky if central bank actions are perceived to be falling behind the curve. Inflation expectations could shift upwards and quite suddenly so. So monetary policymakers, in my view, cannot afford to wait until they see the anchoring because when you see it in the data, it's too late for a measured approach to tightening. The economic costs of reining in inflation are likely to increase further over time, and this is one lesson of history. Against this background, one is again reminded of the argument of Angeloni, Koenen and Smets that I cited a bit earlier. In order to prevent the anchoring, the persistence of inflation should be overstated rather than understated, and a forceful monetary policy response is advisable precisely when uncertainty about it is particularly high. Inflation occurs when people start talking, start talking about inflation is uh, a saying that I guess you all know. So it is now up to the central banks to make sure that people can stop talking about inflation. And in uncertain times, a firm nominal anchor becomes all the more important. And for that anchor to be credible, any suspicion of fiscal or financial dominance need to be dispelled. Dear colleagues, every hike comes to an end. And at the end of hours, we find John Kenneth Galbraith waiting for us. Galbraith bemoaned the extreme brevity of the financial memory and noted that there can be few fields of human endeavor in which history counts for so little as in the world of finance. As far as inflation is concerned, we will have to make a distinction here. Researchers have found that memories of hyperinflation last for generations whereas those of less drastic inflation experiences tend to fade away after about the decade. Thus, for most people, the current price spikes are a painful reminder of the benefits of low and stable inflation. Hopefully, these spikes will go down in history as an isolated episode. Given the high degree of uncertainty, I will refrain from making predictions but there are indications that we will have to accept, as, expect a rather different inflation environment than the one we have been used to. And given this pervasive uncertainty, central banks would be well advised also to show some humility with respect to the complex working of the economy, their capabilities to forecast it, and what monetary policy can achieve. It is my conviction that acknowledging one's own limitations and focusing on the core mandate will help to anchor inflation expectations. Either way, monetary policymakers need not fear what lies ahead as long as they have no doubt or leave no doubt about their commitment to price stability with hard-earned credibility and inflation expectations anchored around the inflation target. Central banks are well equipped 
to maintain price stability even in uncertain times. This makes it all the more important that these uh, achievements are resolutely defended by the central banks and I count on the BIS to support them with great expertise, precise analysis and clear analytical and independent views. At least this is a certainty. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Jens, for uh, taking us in this uh, hiking tour. Mm -hmm. It was indeed a, uh, a tour de force, mm -hmm. and a rather perilous one even for uh, Swiss standards. Mm -hmm. The unprecedented back-to-back uh, -back shocks of the pandemic and uh, <clears throat> the Russian invasion have compounded layers of uncertainty regarding the economic outlook and particularly the inflation outlook, challenging the policy response by central banks in the major financial center, but also in emerging markets. <clears throat> in this journey, Jens, you have taken us uh, through the main structural changes facing the global economy as a source of uncertainty regarding the future path of inflation, energy transition, digitalization, reversal of globalization and demographic change. Regarding these trends, you conclude uh, that the mega trends combine uh, in opposing forces, uh, resulting in thicker fog on the route ahead. On the implications of uh, monetary policy in the current environment, the two issues here, you know, one is understanding the nature of the current inflationary phenomena, and I think that uh, you know, you know, uh, the discussions that we have heard uh, in the past couple of days, uh, the reports, the excellent reports that we heard this morning, have shed light on that. You know, I mean, in general models are not well equipped to deal with uh, supply shocks, and so we have to think about that. On the implications for monetary policy. Uh, well, this is the subject of the next panel, and I will refrain from uh, giving my own views, but let me conclude with one thought regarding uh, emerging markets. Uh, emerging markets face an even more challenging environment. Growth is weakening markedly, and inflation has also risen sharply in almost every region in the world except you know, uh, China, you know, Asia, ex-China. Uh, exceeding about uh, 10, 11 percent, you know, if you take uh, weighted average of inflation in emerging markets. So, uh, <clears throat> as Agustin pointed out this morning, emerging markets started tightening well before uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the tightening of uh, advanced economies. And uh, they may have to overshoot further uh, equilibrium policy rates to compensate higher risk premium, and the need to consolidate credibility, which in the case of emerging markets is more fragile. Uh, this on top of the extraordinary uh, food price increases and shortages, uh, which will further complicate uh, the political situation in this part of the world. Thank you very much. <clears throat>